Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. Um, we're happy to bring you this series uh, every week in the fall and spring semesters. Um, our program today is entitled Health by Design. Can our built environment make us healthier? Uh, one disclaimer for those of you who were hoping to hear Dr. Richard Jackson from UCLA. Today, um, we've had a scheduling uh, difficulty uh, with him, and we're hoping that we will be bringing him uh, for a program in the spring semester, probably something on the order of an extra um, or a special medical center hour. Um, in his absence, however, we have the co-directors of one of our co-sponsoring um, organizations of today's program, uh, the co-directors of the Center for Design and Health, Professors Tim Beatley and Ruben Rainey. The design of sustainable, just, and economically feasible environments for human health and well-being is one of the most urgent needs of the 21st century globally. Aging populations, environmental pollution, rapid urbanization, increased poverty, rising health care costs, the need for preventive medicine and new developments in social and medical science have created a host of design challenges and opportunities. In the U.S. and abroad, cities all around us, urban centers and suburban enclaves alike, are rethinking how their built environments, their structures and their landscapes might contribute to better individual and community health. Be it buildings with greenery climbing the walls, community vegetable gardens and farmers markets, patient-centered health care facilities, new public transportation, bicycle commuting pathways, abandoned rail lines reconfigured as linear parks, all are health-promoting strategies that now enliven many of our communities. If we can but invest sufficiently and ensure accessibility to everyone, those are some of the challenges. In developing areas of the world, the needs can be more dramatic, the solutions more urgent, the planning and fiscal challenges more daunting. I'm thinking of a city like Mumbai in India, where too many people and structures crowded into too little space now compromise the respiratory health of slum residents, and where planners use GPS technologies to map sanitation facilities in these same slums both to plot what's presently inadequate, leaving residents at high risk for infectious diseases, and to plan what's needed for the still burgeoning population. In this Medical Center Hour, Professors Tim Beatley on my far right and Ruben Rainey on my near right, the co-directors of the UVA School of Architecture's Center for Design and Health, both distinguished scholars in this area, will be exploring how designers and planners are meeting these challenges at a variety of scales. What you'll hear about today are design conversations that the health professions must join so that those who practice medicine and nursing and public health may consider their patients' and communities' health and well-being in terms not only of clinic visits, medical interventions, and hospital stays, but also in terms of housing, workspace, food supply, transportation, contact with the natural environment. In short, that we may all work together toward designing and building what makes for a good life. So I think we're in for a good hour with Tim and Ruben, and welcome. And we'll have some time for your comments and questions and discussion at the close of the hour. Let's see, how do I get an image here? There we go. Well, Martha, thank you. Uh, Tim is going to speak a bit later on about the work of the Center for Design and Health, but let me take this opportunity to thank colleagues in the School of Nursing and the School of Medicine and the Department of Psychology for collaborating with the Center on a, on a variety of projects. So the conversation, at least in this university, has well begun, and we hope uh, we're looking forward to uh, continuing it. My part of the program is going to be about, as you can see here, healing spaces in medical facilities. 
Tim will talk about uh, other issues involving uh, neighborhoods and, and cities and the like. This is a big topic. So what I'm going to do is present some preliminary remarks about you know, what I mean by a healing space, uh, how they are designed, how do we know that they work, and then show you uh, two case studies. One is a healing garden, uh, primarily designed for uh, dementia sufferers. And the other is a, a University of Florida New Cancer Center. It's about uh, two years old, which the center has actually been studying uh, the effectiveness of certain of its uh, design features. But I just want to show you uh, some of those features. The study is, uh, is still in, in progress. Now, what do I mean by uh, healing spaces? Well, I think etymology might help us here a bit. Uh, the verb to heal means to make whole which uh, it comes from Middle English uh, halen, from which we derive such terms as wholesome and sound. So a healing space engages both the mind and the body. It's a holistic space. It uh, does not necessarily have to be confined to medical facilities like the BCU Cancer Center here. Uh, it can be a private garden, such as this uh, garden for a CEO in the uh, north of San Francisco. Or it can be uh, one of our great urban parks, Prospect Park in, in Brooklyn, which was uh, designed and still functions to, uh, to relieve the stress of uh, urban living. Now, in a medical facility, healing spaces are directed primarily to relieve stress. And in this uh, venue, I need not say anything about the uh, negative effects of stress on the immune system. I would just simply point out that that stress is not only confined to patients, but to staff, up to physicians and nurses and others, as well as to uh, visitors. Now, how do we know that uh, these spaces work? How do we know that they, they reduce stress? Well, there's a large body of literature. It goes back maybe 30, 35 years. It's uh, primarily social science. In other words, it's not hard science. It doesn't have the ability to control variables and uh, to be replicated and uh, so forth in the way that a rigorous uh, natural science, hard science study would do. It's social science, but yet uh, the better studies certainly control variables and uh, they produce, I would say, strong circumstantial evidence. And that evidence uh, continues to grow. Now, here's one example. Uh, this is a very famous study by Roger Ulrich, which was done in the early 1980s. He took uh, patients in a 200-bed Pennsylvania hospital who were undergoing the same operation, uh, gallbladder removal. They were on the same floor. They had the same nursing staff. <clears throat> he screened them for, uh, you know, for, for smoking and uh, other health problems and eliminated those who had severe problems. The patients uh, were assigned randomly to rooms on that floor, which were absolutely identical in color and furnishing, uh, everything except for one thing. Half the rooms looked into a park lock setting. Half the others looked out the window into a brick wall. And I have to confess, this is not the original views. This is my kitchen window. And uh, <laughs> that's the neighbor's brick wall, which you get, you get the point. Uh, well, to make a long story short and do an injustice to a very, very carefully controlled and sophisticated study, Ulrich found that the patients who had the view of the park-like setting got out sooner, they took less expensive uh, painkiller, and they also complained less, which translates not only into um, humanity, but also it translates into dollars and cents. So that's the kind of study that uh, we rely upon to uh, discuss uh, whether or not these things work and, and to derive design principles which we can apply. Now, what's really exciting now is given the new imaging technology, uh, fMRI scan experiments and things, we can much more precisely now understand the effects of environments on the brain. And also with digital technology, we can mock up uh, medical environments and uh, test certain factors. Here, it's, it's at the uh, University of California, San Diego, in which, in this experiment, uh, this lab assistant is testing wayfinding in a medical facility to see what kind of landmarks will bring a person through. And although you don't see it here, 
people are hooked up to EET caps to measure their brain electricity and there are other kinds of uh, physiological experiments done to see which environments are more stressful and which are not. Now, how are these gardens designed? And I would I'd make two points here. First of all, they are designed to fit a particular medical context. The other thing is they are team designed. Now, this is the Joel Schnepper Garden, uh, designed by landscape architect David Camp. It's in the uh, Terrence Cardinal Cook Medical Center in New York. It's just across from uh, Central Park. Now, I don't have time to go into uh, a lot of detail here, but the patients involved in this garden are AIDS patients. And so the garden is specifically designed through consultations with physicians, with nurses, with physical therapists, with the patients themselves, with their families, with the CEO of the hospital, and also the maintenance staff in a back and forth dialogue to come up with a design. Now let me just point out a few things. For example, we know that uh, HIV positive patients are very sensitive to different degrees of light. So this garden allows for uh, deep shade, it allows for dappled light, it allows for bright sunlight, giving uh, patients a choice. The pavers, you notice how closely spaced they are, that's for wheelchairs, it's also for rolling uh, IV poles over, so there won't be a problem there, vibration and, and what have you. You'll notice the planters are at different heights so that uh, gardening can take place standing up or from a wheelchair and so forth. So you can see how this specific garden, there are many more details which I could discuss but I want to move on, uh, is really designed for a particular medical situation with, with a team. <clears throat> Another example, the VCU Cancer Center Garden in Richmond. Cancer patients have somewhat different needs. Of course, we see the race planner here for wheelchair accessibility. But since uh, many cancer patients are nauseated, <clears throat> either by uh, chemotherapy or uh, radiation therapy, all of the plants in this garden are <coughs> non-scented plants. Uh, they're flowers, but uh, they have virtually no scent, which is another example of what I was talking about. So let me, with those uh, preliminary remarks, let me uh, talk about two uh, case studies here. The first one is the Life Enrichment Center in uh, Kings Mountain, North Carolina, designed by landscape architect uh, David Camp of uh, Dirtworks uh, PC, which is a firm that uh, operates out of New York City. Actually, David Camp is uh, one of the early graduates of our landscape architecture program here. Now, just as in the case of Joel Schnapper Garden and the VCU Garden, this one is designed to address the needs of dementia sufferers. I would say 80% of the people who use this adult daycare center suffer from some form of dementia, uh, either vascular dementia, but most of them uh, Alzheimer's, they're in some of the early or, or the mid stages of Alzheimer's. Well, we know now a lot about what they need uh, in a garden design. First of all, uh, they're prone to claustrophobia. Uh, they're easily disoriented uh, spatially. Uh, they need, uh, many of them need uh, active uh, walking and exercise, which is calming. They need exposure uh, to nature and, and the like. So we can see built into this plan Here's the building, which I don't have time to go into, but let's just talk about the garden. The garden has a fence around it. It's very transparent, and from most points in the design, it's virtually invisible. The, uh, the garden is really three parts. There's a porch, which is the socializing area where, where people gather. Some of the more uh, stricken of other people will not go beyond the porch itself. And that porch also serves as a landmark, which I'll show you in a moment. The second part of the garden is the so-called activity garden. It's very simply designed, a cross-axial pattern and an axial pattern. The cross-axis is terminated by uh, two trellises. The trellis here is used mostly for uh, flower arranging and other crafts. The one here is more for socializing, but you can see how simple this design is. Axis, cross-axis. Uh, it's easy to find your way here. And then the third part is this um, strolling path. Notice that it loops back on itself 
It does not offer choices. It does not lead people into a, into a corner which would confuse them, and yet it exposes them to uh, wonderful trees and grasses and that sort of thing, which are very calming. So you can see again how this specific design is targeting uh, certain symptoms. This is the so-called living room of the facility, which gives way immediately to the garden. The garden is always visible. These are skylights which uh, allow natural light into the space itself, which uh, is uh, extremely important. The porch, we can see, uh, has a raised fireplace. The entry here uh, is to the side, so people uh, uh, coming into the garden do not disrupt anything going on here. You'll notice also, well, it's hard to see, but uh, the roof is slightly transparent to create uh, somewhat dimmer light here for people who, who may be suffering from cataracts or glaucoma and sensitive to bright light as they sit in this area of the porch itself. The uh, paving is cushioned for obvious reasons. And you'll notice that uh, what we would call the design expression or vocabulary, I call it neo-colonial, but it fits in with the uh, specific uh, architectural traditions of this region, the Western North Carolina. It's not an avant-garde building by Frank Gehry, as much as I like Frank Gehry's work. It does not belong in this particular setting. Now you can see here, looking back at the porch, how it is a kind of beacon or a lighthouse that you can see from every point in the garden itself. And I should mention also that staff can survey what's going on in the garden uh, from inside the building itself. But you can see what a landmark uh, that uh, particular porch is. Uh, the cross axis where the trellises are, this is the one used mostly for crafts. You'll notice a raised area here for gardening. Uh, the flagpole located here. It's very important in this facility that uh, participants have, I would call them rituals, repetitive activities every day which are calming. So the old veterans every morning will raise the flag. There are other groups that will uh, attend to the bird feeders. Another group will arrange the flowers. Another group will do some of the cooking and so forth and so on. And some of the features of the garden itself uh, cater to these uh, repetitive uh, calming rituals. Just as in the Joel Schnapper Guide, you see planters at different levels here, so with a walker or from a wheelchair, uh, one can engage in gardening, which again is a very calming activity for most of the participants. The uh, wonderful expanse of the stroll garden you see here, that the fence is virtually invisible. Fortunately, the slope drops off, so the fence can be uh, placed beneath that slope. So this spaciousness completely uh, destroys any uh, sense of uh, claustrophobia. And then the, the walk itself, it winds a bit to create anticipation, but it loops back on itself, and it has all kinds of opportunities for multi-sensual experiences, not just visual, but uh, running your hands along these uh, beautiful grasses and, and that sort of thing as part of the circuit walk. And you can see the bird feeders here that are uh, part of the routine of those that are assigned to them. Many of these people are from agricultural backgrounds, so there is a very active uh, gardening group that grows vegetables for the uh, kitchen. And again, we see the fence here. It's very visible, but notice how transparent it is. It's, it's painted what I call Charleston green, and it, it tends to recede into the landscape even where it's visible. Now, here's what happens when uh, a garden for dementia sufferers is designed not taking these principles into account. Now, to be fair uh, to this facility, and they were very open to uh, telling me about the problems that it had, this garden is, was designed in the late 70s before we knew as much as we know now about what to put in a, a garden and what, what to leave out for a garden of this type. Uh, you'll notice immediately the brick wall, that very thick brick wall. It's not transparent. It's very high. Uh, it uh, created a, uh, such a feeling of claustrophobia that very few of the dementia sufferers would even go out into it. They would just stop at the door, freeze, and turn around and, and go back. And also, with the best of intentions, have a waterfall and a rock garden cascading down into a pool. Well, uh, unfortunately, that became an escape route, and those who went out into the garden uh, many of them tried to climb up the wall and jump it and, and escape. One man took off all of his clothes. He was this huge uh, a former tight end from the University of North Carolina, you know, six foot four and, and weighing over well over 200 pounds. 
when his caregiver turned her back on him, he took off all his clothes, ran up the wall, and jumped it, and took off in the subdivision that, that surrounds the site. So that's, uh, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, if, if uh, you don't apply these uh, evidence-based design principles, you can create more problems than, uh, than you address. So to end on a more positive note, uh, the Life Enrichment Center Garden is very successful. It, uh, it relieves the stress and, and delights the, uh, many of the dementia sufferers, and it makes the job of the staff uh, much easier. Uh, and obviously, the point is that uh, the key thing in any medical facility is professionalism and, and compassion of the staff. What good design can do is to uh, create an environment in which uh, medical practice, whatever it is, can flourish and uh, it can reinforce what the caregivers are doing. Now, in, in a very brief amount of time, I want to switch to uh, buildings and talk briefly about uh, certain key design principles that need to, uh, to be embodied in buildings. Now, I love to talk about our Emily Curry Cancer Center, but we've had about three programs on the Emily Curry Center. So I won't talk about it today, which is hard for me because I get very enthusiastic about it. It's a great, great building. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on the Shands University of Florida uh, Hospital here. But uh, in uh, showing you a slide here of Martha Jefferson Hospital, all three of these buildings uh, embody these principles. Now, there are more of them, but these are some of the most important. Exposure to natural light, we know from evidence-based design studies, is very important in a medical environment, of course, there, there, there are exceptions. But it's, uh, it creates a very, very uh, healing space in, in the sense of the word I've defined it. Clear wayfinding is extremely important. If people are getting lost in some sort of uh, maze, uh, it creates a, a lot of stress, particularly for uh, patients and visitors. Uh, contact with nature, we know from studies like Ulrich and others, which have been replicated uh, very frequently, that contact with virtual nature, paintings, of course we have a great art program here uh, in our uh, medical uh, center, but either virtual or the real thing with gardens uh, is also important. Excellent ventilation, that's obvious, I don't have, need to talk about that. Noise abatement, extremely important. Test uh, Evidence-based design shows that uh, noise is the number one stressor in a medical environment, and it's extremely important to dampen it at all costs. And then if private rooms are in the facility, and Emily Couric is obviously being outpatient, doesn't have a lot of private rooms, but uh, in larger uh, hospitals, uh, they are private rooms. They, they allow uh, less contagion, and they also allow 24-hour visitation and, and the like. So these are all important design principles. Let me just briefly show you how they are embodied in the Shands University of Florida Cancer Hospital. I can show you these principles, uh, most of them, by just looking at the facade of the building itself. Uh, the entry area is very well marked, and you can see how transparent it is. A lot of light comes in. Uh, if, you're, if you're visiting someone, you simply go up the elevator. The visitors' lounges are here uh, with views of the landscape and a tremendous amount of light flowing into them. And the patient rooms are here with uh, huge amounts of light as well. You can just see that from the administration of the building itself. The, uh, it has a wonderful ventilation system, state of the art. It has a great noise abatement. We're looking from the garden, the hospital garden here, back at it. So it has uh, you know, gardens, but it also has a wonderful art program, a 25-year-old art program that was started by the physicians themselves. So there are two landscape images of the Florida landscape in every patient room. So let's, uh, let's go inside the building and I'll very quickly show you just some examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, this is the, the entry uh, area here. You, you simply come into the atrium space. You can see how well lighted it is, a great lift, spatial lift of the ceiling. This is the waiting room for the, uh, the waiting lounge for the, for the uh, operating rooms. Note the amount of light, but also the rugs here, which uh, dampen sound, as does the uh, ceiling. Uh, these are the uh, patient lounge areas in the visiting areas in that, what they call the sail, that great part of the hospital that bends almost like a, on the facade, like a sailing ship. 
sail with views of the landscape, again, with rugs to dampen uh, sound and, and so forth. And then the rooms themselves, uh, a la Roger Glorick, a room with a landscape view here in the great, uh, what's called Payne's Prairie, which is a beautiful uh, nature preserve uh, south of Gainesville. The, uh, all the rooms are private, and you can see one of the uh, images of the Florida landscape here, flowers for visitors, and then there's one, you don't see it here, on the uh, opposite wall itself. And what's interesting is that these, uh, they're all photographic images, were contributed by the staff. And there are plaques uh, right here that tell you who, who, you know, who contributed the image. So, it, and what this did for the staff, it does great things for the patients, but what it did for the staff is to boost their morale because they felt they were, they were part of the caregiving in a, in a very unique kind of way. Uh, one other uh, feature that I think is very interesting in this hospital, it has a, an external stair way that is very, very transparent. You can see it here. So nurses, if they just want to get away for a moment, they can't leave their patients uh, for any length of time. They can step into the stairway, and they have a view. They have uh, a lot of light streaming in. Uh, it also, for uh, patients who need to exercise to... Uh, uh, to ward off blood clots and that sort of thing. The stair becomes an exercise area. It's not just enclosed space, but something quite beautiful. And then something I like, the ceilings of all the elevators have uh, nature scenes uh, backlighted on them. So that will give you just some uh, examples of the kind of uh, design principles that are being applied to create uh, healing spaces in, in medical facilities, both at uh, the Life Enrichment Center and at the uh, Shands University of Florida Hospital. So that uh, concludes my part of the program, and I will uh, turn it over to Tim. Okay, is that on? And let's see, I'm gonna find my, my clicker. All right, well thank, thanks so much. And Marcia, it's great to be here again. Uh, I was thinking about how many, couple, two, three times I've done this medical hour. It's always fun to come over this part of the grounds. And I'm always inspired by Ruben, um, who, whenever I hear him speak, gives me great hope in the power of thoughtful design. Um, my, and I think we complement each other well, because my focus of my work is at sort of a larger scale, larger level, typically at uh, community or at regional uh, level. A challenge of designing healthy places. Well, the challenge is that picture in the background, uh, which we, we recognize now in the last uh, several decades in particular, the more we have spread out, the more sprawl we have seen, the more car dependent we've become, the more sedentary our lifestyles, the less healthy we are. Uh, if Dick Jackson were here, he might ask you, might tell you something like, if you can tell me your zip code, I can tell you your life expectancy, or something to that effect, or how, how, much, how much you weigh, or, uh, so our larger community physical environment has a huge impact on, on health. So I guess that's my, my main point. We have a lot of evidence there. Uh, here's uh, one piece of it. The RAND study a few years ago showing comparing sprawled uh, communities with uh, more compact com communities, finding that those in sprawling communities suffer from a variety of chronic health problems, asthma, hypertension, arthritis, chronic lung, lung disease, etc. And uh, we have a particular problem, of course, with um, our sedentary lifestyles. And uh, just last week, this uh, journal, Diabetes Research and Clinical Practice, had, had a piece that summarized 12, 12 years of research uh, concluding that prolonged sedentary behavior adversely associated with health outcomes, we know this, including cardiometabolic risk, biomarkers, type 2 diabetes, and premature mortality, even in otherwise healthy individuals. And I thought the, the, the conclusion of the author was kind of interesting. There's a possibility that the, the average 30 minutes of daily exercise will not be enough to undo the, undo the hours of exposure to sitting. That's, uh, that 30 minutes is, of course, a very optimistic um, goal and not something most, most of us are able to achieve. It's a whole lot easier, though, if we can figure out how to design it into our communities and into our daily lives. This is my reference, my referential slide to Dick Jackson. This is actually a slide I got from him a number of years ago. He's been talking about this for a long time. Uh, this is a real slide. People, you know, riding the escalator up to the health club. Heaven forbid that we would ever get any exercise on the way to getting exercise. So that's, you know, the American approach to exercise is we've got to schedule it in from 
2.30 to 3.10 or whatever it is, and then we get in our car to drive somewhere to, you know, to do it. And uh, so a challenge for us, uh, for my profession, planning, uh, is to think about how we can, how we can make that uh, just a regular part of daily activity, it's a, a regular part of what, what you get, the, uh, the health benefits of living in a particular place. That means, of course, that we have to think about um, connected neighborhoods and sidewalks and, and trees and, and making uh, those neighborhood and community conditions amenable to, to outside activity and walking. So there are many dimensions, uh, multiple dimensions, multiple scales, and that's partly my message here is that uh, this, our new Center for Design and Health is ambitious in trying to think about uh, all of the different ways uh, in which design can affect health, uh, from the design of that interior space and that building, uh, all the way out to the sort of regional uh, scale, maybe even beyond. Uh, many different issues have just mentioned the physical ac activity, creating uh, conditions where we can walk and, and bicycle, uh, creating the, the design qualities, community qualities where people come together, where they have friendships and connections, gathering spaces, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, there's an image here about a, of a grocery store. Increasingly, we're thinking about food. We know that's a huge uh, dimension of, of health, and there are, are uh, tremendous physical environment uh, implications there and, and um, ways in which designing the physical environment uh, affects access to healthy food. Is there a, a full-purpose grocery store uh, in one's neighborhood? Uh, is there ready access to fre fresh fruits and vegetables? Often not. We hear a lot about the notion of, a, of food deserts, and that's a huge uh, issue uh, uh, for us. So we have this new, I think, Ruben, we're coming up on our second year. Um, we launched the Center for Design and Health spring of 2011, I think. This is a screensaver, a screenshot of our uh, webpage, uh, uvadesignhealth.org. Uh, please uh, come and visit, take, take a look. Uh, we're trying to do a number of things. We're, we're trying to begin conversations around grounds, and as Rubens mentioned, we, we already have a number of connections and conversations between the School of Architecture and the medical school, and nursing school. We're co-sponsoring lectures. We're supporting small uh, research grants for faculty interested, particularly in architecture, thinking about how, how uh, they might, uh, an architecture professor might think about health. Uh, outside the School of Architecture, we're trying to, in a sense, invite um, the faculty uh, to join us in this mission. And we, we uh, two years ago, started uh, something we're calling the Design and Health Fellows. Uh, program and there's a picture of Sophie Trawalter, uh, who is a psychology professor here at UVA. She was our inaugural inaugural fellow, and we have uh, three new fellows uh, starting this year, and uh, so a lot of other uh, things that we're doing. But we're very excited about it. A lot of the work, in, uh, interestingly enough, is, is is focused at a kind of neighborhood level. So I wanted to at least have one slide that that made that point. Um, we have one neighborhood in Richmond that we're beginning to work with and study and understand how interventions at a neighborhood level uh, could lead to more healthy uh, lives and lifestyles. This actually is a community in the Netherlands that I've been studying and, and, and uh, part of a documentary film uh, we've made about nature and cities. Uh, what is it at the neighborhood level? Well, it's, it's something that is a little bit more manageable. We can sort of you know, get our heads around what those qualities are that, that help us to, to be more physically active and, and to be outside and to be more, uh, to have more uh, deeper social contact with other people. Uh, this particular community is very compact, uh, a mixing of uses. So there are things around that, that one can walk to. There are sidewalks. There are, there's an effort to limit the, the impact of automobiles. This is largely a car-free uh, neighborhood, and it's very green. And, uh, that that uh, interior feature actually is an orchard. Uh, that kind of is at the very center of the, of the community. So uh, a few kind of overarching slides. I wanted to spend the rest of the time that I have kind of building on a point that Ruben made about the power of nature. So one of our uh, research projects that we have going on in the center is uh, what I've been calling the Biophilic Cities Project. Uh, about a year ago, we uh, got some funding from the Summit Foundation, Washington, D.C.-based uh, foundation. Uh, to examine the, the power, the impact that nature at a kind of community level can have. Um, building on this notion of biophilia, this is a, an idea that Ed Wilson, Neil Wilson from Harvard, Harvard biologist, 
kind of popularized this, this notion. Here's one of his uh, definitions, biophilia, the innately emotional affiliation of human beings to other living organisms. Innate means hereditary and hence part of ultimate human nature. This idea that we have co-evolved with nature, that we're carrying with us our ancient brains, uh, and that really for us to be uh, healthy and happy and productive and to, and to lead meaningful lives requires us to have contact with the natural world, with nature. And it's not something optional. It's something that we, we absolutely need, and it's not something that we can just get on a holiday uh, on vacation during the summer. We've got to have that nature, that exposure, that contact with nature uh, all the time, at least on a daily basis, um, if not more frequently. So it's got to be everyday nature. It's got to be around us. So um, a lot of evidence, uh, Ruben mentioned the Roger Ulrich uh, study. We have a, a lot of other evidence that's sort of kind of outside the building uh, focus uh, at the community level. Uh, here's one image about the, uh, this fantastic um, uh, evidence from Japan, they, they call it forest bathing. I love this concept of forest bathing, you know, that you're walking in a forest and you have the dappled lights and, the, and the, the colors and the sounds of birds, and it's really immersion in the sense of bathing. Uh, so it's a, bathing is a good word to use, but they're finding, maybe not surprisingly, that, that walking you know, through a forest uh, results, results in reductions in stress hormones and boosts our immune systems. So we want to see more of that nature in, in cities and in communities. We want to see more people using it. Nature is uniquely qualified, uniquely suited to bring us together and to foster new social contact and friendships. And uh, these two women on the left, actually, we filmed them a couple of years ago. Uh, they are um, amateur urban wildlife trackers. So they've actually gone to school to recognize uh, track marks, and so we followed them around one day. It's, uh, they're in a canyon in San Diego, and this canyon uh, turns out to be a place where rather different people from rather different neighborhoods that circle the space come together and meet and have formed friendships that would otherwise not ha happen. So whether it's through a birding club or, or a native plants uh, society or, or uh, an amateur tracking club like this, nature can bring us together. We know, of course, about the health benefits of social contact and, and overcoming <coughs> social isolation and the, you know, the, the more extensive and deeper your friendship networks are, uh, the healthier you are likely to be. So designing communities can help us in that, in that way. Uh, greening urban environments um, can make them safer. Um, there are these indirect as well as direct impacts from, from the natural world. This is, um, can't see this very well, but the results of a, a study last year published in the American Journal of Epidemiology, a very interesting study of the impact of greening, of planting trees in vacant lots in Philadelphia, comparing the impacts in those neighborhoods uh, to similar vacant lots without the greening. And again, not a big surprise maybe, uh, seeing that that greening process results in reductions in gun violence, gun assaults uh, in, these, in these neighborhoods, and, uh, and actually uh, uh, showing uh, an the less stress and, and an increase in exercise in these neighborhoods that, that have lots that have been green. Um, lots of very pretty compelling stories about how these cities are, are going about their greening. Uh, agenda and, and Philly has a huge challenge um, uh, before it, but one interesting um, nonprofit is called the Philly Orchard Project. They, they actually are working with um, disadvantaged neighborhoods in that city to plant orchards. And uh, these are, these are um, projects, orchards, in which the community, the neighborhood, takes over the, the task of, of pruning and managing and maintaining these orchards and becomes a community building. Uh, activity as well. So the rest of my slides actually have to do uh, with fleshing out this idea of what is a biophilic city? What is a city that is full of nature where, where uh, residents, urbanites have, have this, uh, these contacts, these opportunities to connect with the natural world? A biophilic uh, community is certainly a community that has a lot of, of green space and a lot of nature. Um, this background image is Helsinki. Uh, very inter uh, interesting, interconnected, multi-scale green system. So a biophilic city ought to be a place where you, you, ought to, you ought to be able to walk out your front door, have nature all around you, and then walk to progressively larger uh, amounts of nature, green space, as you, as you move into the larger 
uh, city and region. So in Helsinki, you can actually walk from very uh, dense ur urban environments in the center of the city all the way out to old growth forest at the edge. So this Biophilic Cities project, I don't have time to say very much about it. There's a, another web page, biophiliccities.org, if you'd like to take a look. And a lot of the project is being run through a series of partnerships uh, with cities around the US and, and around the world. And I just wanted to show you a few slides to give you a sense of what some of those, those partner cities and study cities are. Um, this is our partner in Spain, Victoria Gastez, the capital of the Basque country, and this is Luis who heads the environment program, and he's standing in front of a very ambitious map. Um, Victoria is impressive for its green belt that circles this very, very compact city, so it's actually never very far to, to get to some green space, and the latest ambition actually is to, is to build what they're calling an interior green belt, which is to bring nature into the very a core, a very center of this dense uh, city. So there's actually one quarter here where they're going to be daylighting a stream, a stream that's in a pipe under, underground, bringing that stream uh, to, the, to the surface. Oslo um, is another city we've been studying and working with. Uh, two thirds of the city is a protected forest. You're never very far from, from, for, uh, from a forest environment, a very extensive uh, network of trails in, in Oslo. Uh, so the nature, in, a, in the context of a very compact, dense, uh, ur urban environment, nature is, is nearby, that forest is nearby. San Francisco, we signed an agreement with the, the planning department in, uh, in San Francisco, Francisco to collaborate on biophilic uh, projects, and one of the interesting things San Francisco is doing, you may have heard about this, they, they've become an innovator in creating small parks in a very dense city where there isn't a lot of vacant land. Uh, how, do you, how do you expand that, the, that park network, that network, network of green space? So these, uh, they're calling parklets, and this is the first residential parklet in the city. So what these are, these are two, two to three on-street car parking spaces converted to little mini parks. And so Jane, Jane Martin, shown here, is a landscape architect, and she is the designer of this particular one, which includes a vegetative dinosaur, which you see here, by the name of Trixie. Um, and it's a very creative strategy. There are more than 20. Uh, parklets now that have been permitted in, in San Francisco. Portland, Oregon is another example. They've been innovating in the area of stormwater management, creating this idea of green green streets, streets that have uh, nature and greenery, but also collect and manage stormwater. Uh, this is our partner, Linda Dobson, heads the stormwater management program for the Bureau of Environmental Services in, in Portland. And this is a very interesting, ooh, I'm going I need to go back. Uh, very interesting, ah, <laughs> very interesting building um, tenth at Hoyt uh, Apartments that collects stormwater and then uh, celebrates it. A series of uh, kind of art and water, moving the water around, and actually residents come out after after it rains to listen to the rain, to listen to the water moving around in the courtyard. It's quite interesting. So okay, uh, we're just beginning to work in in Phoenix, and uh, um, this person on the right, Jane Rao. Uh, is a co-founder of something we're, we're beginning to study, which is the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy, a, a nonprofit that manages a, an amazing 17,000-acre desert preserve uh, adjoining um, the built-up area of Scottsdale, Arizona. She is now 90 years old, and she's one of 400 steward volunteers who manage this park. It's a, an amazing demonstration of the power of nature uh, for older uh, Americans, this, 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 Jane goes out actually every morning. I think she gets up at four in the morning and goes out and works on the trail. She gives tours. She meets with school groups, and her physician is very happy about this. Uh, she tells me that her bone density is up, her weight is back to what it was when she was in high school, uh, and she's meeting. She has lots of friends, and that's again the power of nature. So Phoenix is another place where we're doing some work. Uh, recently come back from Milwaukee. This is a community garden uh, in, the, in the city of Milwaukee. Fantastic story uh, of, a, of a fairly disadvantaged neighborhood uh, that now has green space and food productions uh, and, and gathering space and um, employment for disadvantaged youth, uh, among others, among other things. 
Milwaukee is an interesting story. Uh, they just opened their third branch of an urban ecology center. 80,000 people a year go to these ecology centers. It's a fantastic story of how, of how one city is trying to connect its population uh, to the nature uh, there. I uh, think finally, uh, my example of Singapore, uh, another international example, a, a pretty amazing story of a city that's trying to grow vertically, a very Asian city where most people are living in high-rise uh, apartment buildings. How do you foster, how do you create the conditions for contact with nature in that setting? Well, the, the um, uh, National Parks Board in Singapore has a sky, sky-rise greening program and they're giving subsidies for the installation of green walls, uh, green facades, green rooftops, um, uh, balcony uh, food production, uh, a whole range of things. Uh, one of the interesting things about Singapore is that they have managed to set aside a lot of parks, and then they have this amazing connector network uh, tying these large parks together and actually connecting where most people live um, uh, with these large uh, parks through, through mostly elevated or largely elevated systems like this one that you, that you see. So this is a, a, a city, an island that has actually grown in, by a couple of million people uh, over the last 20 years. At the same time, the percentage of the area covered by vegetation, by green things, has actually increased in that time um, as well. A lot of creative uh, urban design, uh, urban greening ideas coming out of Singapore. Uh, we've actually been doing some filming for a documentary film about uh, Singapore. This is one project. It's an eight-story tall green green wall in the heart of the business district in, in, uh, in Singapore. We spent a little bit of time filming at this uh, very green school. The kids are standing in front of it. They're very proud of the, the fernery in the back. And I don't have an image of it, but one of the most impressive, most dramatic green walls I've ever seen is a wall that was designed and built by the kids at this school with a little bit of money from the Singapore uh, government. So I'm coming up on the last couple of slides. Uh, I thought I would end actually with the story. By the way, there is this uh, Singapore documentary film is now on YouTube if you're interested. So if you just Google. Uh, biophilic Singapore, um, you, will, you will find it. And it um, uh, is organized in a series of chapters. And, and one chapter is about um, the KTPH, uh, the hospital, very amazing hospital, a relatively new hospital in Singapore. I think perhaps the most biophilic hospital I've seen anywhere. A lot of things that you can do in Singapore because of the tropical environment, uh, but it's really quite remarkable. You get a little sense of it uh, in the background here. They have an amazing green uh, courtyard, which has a waterfall. And, and perhaps most impressively, um, they, they have set the standards a little bit differently. So the CEO, in, in setting the charge for the architects, basically said, uh, what we want to do, we want a building uh, where uh, when patients walk in, their, their blood pressure and their heart rate actually go down rather than the reverse. And not only that, we want, we want a hospital that will serve as an arc. We want to have a hospital that will help to compensate for the loss of tropical rainforest and the impact on species. So this is a quote from just as the rest of the world is chopping down the rainforest. We declare ourselves the Noah's Ark of tropical rainforest. That means we, we try to we consciously bring back species. Um, and, and in this case, you walk into this hospital, they, are, they, are, they have a sign they're judging their success by the number of bird species and butterfly species that are seen in, in and around the hospital. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, this is, I think, my next to last slide. Um, one of the other dramatic aspects of this hospital is that it has a, a, a farm on the roof, and uh, it, including 140 fruit trees. And uh, the, actually, many of the residents, many of the patients have rooms that look down on this farm, and the surveys uh, of residents suggest the patients suggest that they very much enjoy uh, watching that. And that's a very important biophilic uh, feature uh, for them. Okay, I think this is my last slide, which is to make a little bit of a pitch. There is a book called Biophilic Cities um, that might be of interest. It has a lot more detail about what I mean by bio biophilic urbanism or biophilic cities. And then we have this web page which has a, a page for each of the study cities, each of the partner cities that we're, we're working with. So the power 
of nature. It's something that Ruben and I, uh, it's an interest uh, we both share, and so I think in many ways our collaboration is a little microcosm of the potential of our center to bring together, um, we're, our disciplines are already pretty closely aligned, but we're working at different scales. And so we invite all of you um, to, to join us in this, um, this mission. So I'll stop there, and do we have any time? I haven't even seen the, oh, we do, great. Thank you so much. Um, we have some time for um, conversation. Um, I think we have people from, uh, certainly from medicine and nursing, perhaps from other parts of the university as well, and I would encourage you to offer your questions and comments. We will bring a microphone to you, and I would ask that you please um, identify yourself uh, when you ask your question or make your comments. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you. I'll have a race. <laughs> uh, hey, and thanks for the talk. My name is Jason Bennett. I work in the library here at the med school. And I was wondering, besides just stress reduction, are there any studies on exposure to nature in terms of learning? There are. And if so, um, okay. are there resources? Darn it, on, I thought I had that. Well, no, no, I think you're going ready to. Are there resources yes. on the grounds to kind of make that happen? You know, if we wanted to make our library more sort of biophilic. Oh, well, uh, yeah, there's a lot of evidence um, about the, the positive impact of nature and learning and, and, and in different, different scales and different environments. So, for example, uh, whole literature about the impact of day daylight daylight in, in school, uh, elementary school environments, and, and showing pretty, pretty dramatically day, full spectrum natural daylight schools that, that have that in every room. You know, uh, we have a number of very positive examples that I could share with you. I'm not sure about libraries, but so test scores go up. Um, uh, health, you know, generally Im improving teacher productivity and happiness, you know, going up. All, all those things, not rocket science. We have a Canadian study that, that shows that tooth decay, you know, goes down. <laughs> and, and kids in daylits and daylit schools, the magic of the power of nature. Um, and, and one study that shows that kids go grow taller. I said that once in a presentation, and I had a parent come up afterwards and say that they weren't sure they wanted their child to grow taller. But, but uh, <laughs> no, so there's a lot of evidence. Uh, the, the learning um, impacts. Uh, we know that um, outdoor learning, for example, has a huge has huge benefit, huge power to to, um, to educate the use of. of of outdoor areas and schools. Every school, you know, really ought to be. It's very interesting that we have, uh, even in Charlottesville, we have schools that are perched on the edge of the right hand trail or park, and it's not really being integrated into the pedagogy of that school. But there's tremendous power teaching mathematics, teaching science, teaching reading, and everything with nature uh, pays tremendous benefits. Yeah, let me just add something. Uh, of course, in my presentation, I, I stress stress relief, but there's also evidence that uh, contact with, with nature and natural light inspires creativity. I think probably everyone in here is familiar with uh, the Salk Institute in, in La Jolla, uh, Joan Salk's research uh, facility that the, the great architect Louis Kahn designed. And it has a, a fantastic landscape view of the Pacific Ocean right down the center of it. And Salk was stymied in his research on the polio vaccine. He went to Italy, he lived in Assisi, he experienced that wonderful landscape and had a breakthrough in his thinking. And he, he had very strong feelings that uh, exposure to biophilia and the landscape would inspire the creativity of his scientists. So, you know, in the case of the library, um, I would, you know, I'm not, I've been in it, I'm not that familiar with it. But the more natural light, the better. And uh, landscape images uh, would, would you know, be a help in, in not so much reducing stress, it could do that, but just inspiring the kind of creativity that when you're researching in a library. Good. Hi, thank you. 
Uh, Liz is my name, and I'm a chaplain. So the uh, studies can be persuasive. I'm wondering about the cost. Um, I hear about passive house and uh, ways to integrate ecologically friendly um, ideas in architecture and even city planning, but it always seems to cost a lot more. So can you speak to the challenges of that, especially in our times? Uh, well, let me take the example of medical facilities. Of course, that's a key issue. And uh, any CEO, any person is going to want to see some kind of proof of this. There have been some studies, and they are they're controversial, so there's not you know consensus on them. That in the short term, in a medical facility, things like uh, more fenestration, the, the expense of dampening sound, uh, the creation of gardens, and all that sort of thing. In the short term, obviously, it's more expensive, but in the long term, uh, uh, more than pays for itself. Now, what I mean by the long term, there was a—it's a hypothetical study in which uh, CEOs. Architects, people who knew, uh, particularly hospital design, so they're not amateurs, they're very familiar with them, created a, a hypothetical hospital. And they had two versions of it, one with certain features and one without them. Costed them out. The construction cost, I think, was uh, substantially more, something like $20 million more to implement the state of the art facilities. But they figured out that within two years, this would pay for itself. Uh, how? Well, it would attract patients, it would reduce medical errors, so lawsuits, and uh, from there on out, it, it would be something that would attract uh, patients. So there have been a number of these studies. As I say, we need really to, it, it's hard to, to get the, to control the variables. But uh, what I hope someday, someone's going to take a, a hospital that gets rehabbed with these new facilities and does a before and after study of it to prove this. But already there, there are studies that indicate this. And for better or for worse, I mean, in our capitalist society, the hospitals compete with each other for patients, obviously. And uh, the ones with the better facilities tend to draw more patients. There's some studies, again, and I'm, you know, I'm skeptical of a lot of this, but some studies show that some patients will actually choose a hospital that is, is better designed, that has more of these features over the uh, imminence of the medical staff itself, because they see the well-designed building and whatever it is as emblematic of the kind of care they're going to receive there. I might just add a couple, a couple of things just to echo that uh, sentiment about uh, there might be a small upfront up cost. It's often not as much as we think it is to do the green elements and things like green rooftops. It turns out that that you know uh, that strategy um, prolongs the life of the underlying roof. So in fact, it's a very cost-effective thing to do if you're thinking about. 30, 40 or years, a longer, a longer time frame. So there is a, a very strong economic argument to make for, for most of the urban, most of the greening things I'm, I'm interested in. And some of the things pay for themselves almost immediately. I mentioned the day, daylighting of elementary schools. And we have, we have examples from North Carolina where because of the downsizing of heating and cooling systems and the, elect, the, the profound reduction in electric you know, power consumption, uh, these these uh, additional daylighting uh, elements pay for themselves in six months, if not sooner. So it's a very very on on on, on, a, on just sheer you know accounting and cost effectiveness. They make they make sense. But the other cost issue for me is can we can we really afford not to do any of these things? I mean there are these huge looming public costs. If Dick Jackson were in the room, he would talk about the billions of dollars of public expense looming when we think about type 2 diabetes, for example. Think, think about long-term, we think about community design. We cannot afford um, car-dependent, you know, non-pedestrian places where people can't get out and be physically active. Uh, it's not, it goes well beyond this kind of narrow, cost-effective sort of, sort of debate that we sometimes get into. Yeah, we, we continue to build the most unhealthy cities that you can imagine because of the automobile. And there'll be a huge economic cost. There, there is already from, from that. So. And it's not an easy issue to resolve. I mean, you know, there's no simple answer to it. Okay. 
Hi, uh, I'm Ashley, I'm a public health student, and uh, I was just wondering what kind of interventions you have to get people to have contact with nature during the winter, um, when you're dealing with a lot less greenery and less daylight and maybe less sunlight. Well, that's a key issue, and uh, of course if you're in California, it's not a big problem, right? Um, well, there, there are various ways. The, the virtual depictions of nature, the art, the landscapes, uh, will serve some of that function. If, if you have lavish amounts to spend, if we're talking about uh, exposure to nature, one can have a, a greenhouse, a conservatory that people can, can occupy. Now again, it depends on what kind of facility, because you know the Emily Couric Center, uh, for all the great design features it has, its gardens have to be exterior to the building. There are no plants allowed inside the building at any time of the year because of uh, compromised immune systems. So it depends, but certainly uh, virtual nature, uh, things of that sort, plus uh, if, if one can actually have the greenhouses and things of that sort. In addition, I would say uh, partly this is a cultural challenge. Um, we, we tend to spend a lot of time in, inside in the winter months. Maybe that's for obvious reasons, but it doesn't have to be that way. And some of our study cities are northern latitude, you know, they're, they're northern winter, wintry cities, and there the culture is quite different. And it's get, it, you, you're, you get outside. In schools, the teaching of, of elementary kids in, in Finland, for example, it's 45 minutes inside, go out, take the kids outside for a walk. Another 45 minutes, take them, you know, it, it, we're, it, partly it's about changing our attitude. And, uh, and, and, but each city will have its own particular climatic uh, challenges. And, and um, you know, in Phoenix, it's, it's shade rather than <laughs> you know, winter heat that you're trying to get around.